Welcome into Where in the World is Jason Daly, where I lug a whole bunch of expensive camera equipment around to uh, record a podcast. I don't understand either. Gang, we just had our 50th show last time, and I didn't even acknowledge it. Congratulations all around. Thanks for being here. What a wild ride. This has exceeded my expectations by so much. There's like a thousand people that turn up and watch this silly little thing we're doing every day, and that blows my mind. So thank you for coming and hanging. I like to think we are just making a whole, just creating a whole bunch of little, little, little wee baby change makers around the profession that are having a positive impact. So hopefully we're doing some good here. On the subject of change making, <clears throat> today, it's old timey Tuesday. Uh, the theme for, for this week, well, that's a cute idea, but it'll never work because of client X. You've heard it before. Maybe you're living it right now. This way better way of doing a thing could be fixed billing, could be a different piece of software, could be literally anything. And it's fundamentally better than what you do today, but you can't do it because what will old Mr. McJenkins say? There's some, some part of your business or client today that that just won't work for, and that is a reason for never changing. No, it's not. That's not how it is. Let's talk about it today, some practical ways to navigate this conversation. Uh, it's Old Timey Tuesday. Let's do it on Jason Daly. This was the first decade of my life in this profession. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm a real weirdo and like change more than most people do and get excited about technology and all of those things. And this was just the thing that I was up against probably more than anything else when I was working for other people in firms was, hey, Everybody, check out this very obviously better way of doing this thing. Or should we really be sending paper organizers to people still? Because we've got quite a few clients over here who are like, hey, can you stop sending me these? And this kind of doesn't feel like the future. But the reason you always did it was, what about the olds? You quit worrying about the youths? What about the olds? They don't know how to receive an email or this or that. And what it did, like the really harmful thing that happened was we never changed as a result. And it's one thing to sit in a firm and say, I just, I'm happy doing this till the end of time, the way it is, the status quo and all that. But that wasn't our firm. Like people weren't happy. There was too much work. The partners were like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't quite the lifestyle I want. But they weren't willing to take the firm to what that next better version of the firm was. And, you know, had I been, you know, if I could go back in time and tell that version of me and talk to those superiors that I had, uh, I think the, the main piece of wisdom that I see now that I didn't have then is... Building your firm and taking it from A to B is not always going to be about how does that impact this client that I have today? Because almost any change will be disruptive to a specific client. But it's more about how is this going to enable my next dream client who is fundamentally better than the clients that I have today? So that like that mental shift is one of completely different agency for yourself. The former is, well, we have all these clients, so we have to do what works for all these clients. The latter is, here's what I wanna do. Here's this thing that I think is better. And if I can design the perfect firm for that person, I think we're gonna get them. We're gonna get those clients along with us. The clients in our client base, which are better aligned to that version of our firm, will be happier. Oh my gosh, that was another point of frustration is we had these really killer like long-term clients who would come in and our systems wouldn't be suited 
for those people that worked a different way, but everybody agreed they were the type of clients that we wanted long term, but we couldn't lean into the change that would make them happy and make them feel like they were in the right place. So it can be, it's, it's another example of those scenarios where it's really hard to see that different version of the thing that doesn't exist yet because you're so fixated on what you have today because you have 2020 version vision for what you have today. But if you make that change that creates some friction with what you have today, like you can't see over that next crest yet of like, how is that reality going to be better? Cause you simply haven't lived it yet. But there's so many people who are in unsustainable places right now and aren't really enjoying what they're doing. And even if they are feeling pretty good, like I feel like aren't making the most of what they're capable of, like aren't proactively going out after their ideal client and a, a greater level of specificity. And so when you, when you like think of change constantly through the lens of who are the people and the systems and the clients that I have today, like you will forever be anchored to that unless you can get out of that frame of mind. Frame of, frame of mind has to be, here's where we are today. A firm is always going to be in motion. You're always going to be changing. You're always going to be getting more specific. That's going to be driven by clients, by team members, by your personal interests, by season of life. What do you want to do? That firm should like be, it's okay for that firm to be in flux. That's completely normal. You're learning, you're growing. A product of that should be change. So what is the change that gets you to what looks pretty good right now? Like what is that thing that would be more profitable or that client on your list of a hundred clients right now, who's that one standout client where you're like, well, this seems interesting. Maybe we should do some more of this. If you throw out all the people and all the systems that you have today, what is the ideal firm for that type of client look like? Now, in reality, like we have to be mindful of this to a degree, like you can't piss off 90% of your clients overnight and they all leave, and they don't have any money. So this d stuff still does factor in. But I think in many traditional firms, particularly in traditional tax firms, if you've had a client for 10 years, 15 years, there's a lot of fear in changing the process for them when that's how it's always been. Oftentimes, though, I think we actually underestimate the change that these people are capable of and even like overstate their love for the current process. I have found as I've made these changes and talked with clients about them often, more often than I expected, they're like, oh yeah, that makes way more sense. Or yeah, no, I kind of, that last process kind of sucked. I didn't really like that. What they're doing is what you've told them to, to do. Like that's the process. That's their expectation for how that's going to happen year over year until you tell them differently. A new client walks in the door tomorrow, we've talked about this, like you're crafting their reality every day from scratch. You're not subject to those same limitations. And in, in the interest of like steering this in a constructive conversation with your overlords and with the people that you work with who maybe don't see the world this way, crafting that new reality for new clients who for whom like that inertia in the existing direction doesn't exist, that can be a great way to get some initial wins. Like if it is truly better to make this change and better on the other side of this change, oftentimes for people to get on board, they have to experience that for themselves. And trying this alternate path with certain clients, this can be a way to get them some early wins to then buy into maybe a more ambitious transition to get more folks onto that new program. This episode is sponsored in part by Dark Horse CPAs. Hey, remember last week's Dark Horse ad read? Some of you were concerned with good reason. Listen, I was kidding about the whole shtick with Dark Horse CPAs abandoning computers. Maybe sarcasm isn't your forte. Dark Horse actually strives to be the opposite of everything mentioned in that ad. But sometimes it's just helpful to let people know what it is you don't do to help them frame what it is you actually do. Did you write that down? That's a nice tidbit. That's a good bit of advice. So here's what Dark Horse is not. They're not a franchise. They're not a technology suite that you plug into at arm's length. 
They're not a bench of outsourced accounting labor for your firm. Dark Horse is a platform CPA, and if you don't know, now you know. Instead of spending your time building the wheel for your firm, you could join a firm who's created and constantly evolving the wheel. You don't have to make your own wheel, cave accountant. Instead of spending your time in the areas that aren't driving value for your clients and revenue for your firm, you just join a firm that's gonna help you do all that stuff, right? So you don't have to, I'm just saying, you could become a Dark Horse CPA. Think about it. Hey, if you're thinking about having to reinvent the wheel yourself, if you're thinking about going out on your own, but you don't wanna have to fiddle with like all the admin and all the, all the just having to, you know, do all that stuff yourself, check out these peeps, Dark Horse CPA. Check out the link in the, uh, in the show notes. This episode is sponsored in part by Client Hub. Hey, this week on Tales from the Hub. Yeah, we're doing more of these. Uh, hey, remember last week when Super Smart Accounting Firm, which is totally a real accounting firm, captured all of their workflow processes in Client Hub? How are your SOPs looking right now, huh? That's right, look in the mirror. Now partners don't have to stress when staff members take a vacation this summer, knowing someone else can pick up the client work without missing a beat because all those SOPs, all that documentation, it is, it is squeaky, it's all where it needs to be. Unlike in your firm, right? Oh boy, talking to myself. Speaking of the partners, they've been hearing the staff raving about Client Hub, the water cooler, the break room, Discord, whatever the digital equivalent of this is. <clears throat> so they decided to get in on the fun, the partners that is. Now the partners start their day with the jobs dashboard in Client Hub. It's an easy to use view of all the projects with filters to drill down into just the ones they're interested in, like their own projects, tax projects, accounting pro what do you want? whatever you wanna look at. They get a view into everyone in the firm and what work they're doing for clients. And they can just look in the client hub whenever they want to see where the latest, where the stuff's sitting, you know, where it's, what, what, what are, what are, what, what's everybody doing? Peace of mind delivered, courtesy of client hub. That's it for this week's Tales from the Hub. Check out client hub uh, at clienthub.app client or just use the link in the show notes. That's probably easier than figuring out what I just said. I got some bullet points on like change management more in general and like, some best practices and just like some wisdom I can share from being up against that in firms. Um, oftentimes it's not like going to be a hundred percent solution and like acknowledging these are sticky things. Uh, what is the right pace of change? Uh, that has never been harder to answer than now because change has never been so changey. Change is happening like faster than ever before. When we came into the like cloud accounting age and the like app marketplaces were blowing up and we reached this like never before experience level of app overwhelm, we were like, this is ridiculous. I miss not knowing every single piece of software and what it does. How am I ever going to keep up? But it just got a whole lot worse with all things AI and it's funny, like we're, <clears throat> and we'll probably still do this for a while. We're still talking about AI as like this new technology. When in my mind, like it's bigger than that. AI like is technology now. Like virtually no software provider is not using AI at this point or shouldn't be leaning into AI at this point. Like AI just is technology, but we're treating it as this new thing to learn. And in some ways, by treating it as this arm, this like new specialization, it maybe lets us hide from it for a little bit longer because we decide, okay, for now, like that's not gonna be my expertise. There's gonna be AI people and I'm not gonna invest in that right now. And the reality is like AI is everything, like AI is tech now. And the impact of that is that AI is like changing at an unbelievable rate that is faster than anything we've seen before, new model could drop tomorrow that fundamentally changes the way that we can get some aspects of our work done. And we just don't know when that's gonna happen. So the rate of change has already been a struggle. Like accountants, I mean, you don't wanna generalize, but by and large, like accountants are not known for being excited about change. That being said, man, like, name another industry that has had to change more in the last couple of decades. Like in the grand scheme of things, I do think accountants are maybe sold a little short on how much they are required to change. If you just look at cloud, cloud adoption, 
and how <clears throat> for people like, you know, what my firm did, like we are often the change makers for our SMB clients. Like we are leading the charge into cloud, into integrating systems better, building custom integrations and all of that. But for the members of your team and the people out there who, oh, for whom change is hard, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's probably just going to get worse, actually. I don't know that it's going to get better. Change, like the rate of change and all that, it's just getting more and more hard. So how do you create a healthy place to work for those type of people? Um, does the Is there a greater tax? Like, is there a greater cost to employing folks that are change averse? Or do you need people that are change averse? Like, is there a healthy bit of like, do they create a healthy bit of friction and change that can sometimes just be like too much change, right? I would say something that I think is a positive that can help your team feel like they understand what that process is gonna look like is develop like agreeing to a cadence for change. And I think we talked about this in the past around the context of deciding on a practice management system for a firm. If you put out a meeting for your team and say, ta-da, we're changing practice management systems, 90% of people are going to be like, screw this, man. Here goes the next 24 months of my life. If you say, here's the deal, stuff's changing. We need to move to a better system, but we're going to make it a rule. We're not going to do this more often than like X number of years. To me, that's better. So like, when it comes to kind of the core systems that you rely on, I think because there is this element of like, it's like, well, it's like buying an iPhone used to be where um, like it was growing really fast and it was like there was never a good time to buy an iPhone because at any given point, a better one was just around the corner, right? So then how do you ever choose the right time to jump in? If you never jump in, you've missed the boat. If you jump in now, Man, what if that next thing comes out, you know, next month it's way better. What about that like AI first new software company that drops just this like totally bomb practice management system in three months that's incredible? What then? Like there is no way to navigate that right now and inaction is not an option. So one healthy construct to implement with your team, but also for yourself, because if you are a solo operator, you are just crippled by indecision from all the different types of tech that you see. And it's really hard to turn your brain off to, oh, should I be doing this? And it just kind of adds to that sense of overwhelm. Making that deal to yourself, making that deal to your team about, we're not gonna change this sort of thing any more frequent than X cadence, that's okay. That's probably really healthy right now. Because if you leave that door open to your team, like they are living in this, like for the folks for whom this is most stressful, they're then living in this limbo of, I don't know what this is gonna look like a month from now. Like, what does it even mean to invest in our processes now if we don't know if our systems are gonna get turned on their heads? I don't feel that because I, I enjoy change and I thrive in change and you may have team members that are that way, but a lot of accountants are not that way. So as a firm agreeing upon like cadences, like kind of the maximum cadence at which you will change certain things, that at least gives them like a worst case scenario to plan around so that if in four years time or whatever the deal is, you do change it, everybody's like, yep, that was the deal. And like, I think there's a little less of a degree of them holding that against you then. As mu but that is like still, that is better to me than leaving that door wide open. Change like the success of change, I think it's it's easy to over-rationalize change and see something and be like, this is fundamentally better. And that be the rationale for change. But the success of change like fundamentally comes down to the humans involved. So as hard as it is, as like very rational accounting type people, and I am like shouting at myself right now, if you don't have the people to make it happen, if the people don't have the endurance or the stamina to make it happen, like it's just not an option. So like that, that for me has been a really difficult thing to grapple with when I know that fundamentally better way that there is to do the thing. 
I know how to get it from A to B, and I know that the team has to be involved, like on board for it to work, but folks are exhausted because we just changed practice management systems because we feel like we're at our limit for how much change we've gone through recently. If you just blow straight through that and you're just the ROI robot and you're the one that's not paying attention to people, it not only jeopardizes the success of that change altogether, but it makes people less open to change down the road too. Like it makes change more anxiety inducing. And when you have those negative periods of change management that are really hard on people and create friction between team members, or even if you're solo, like are really, really hard times for you, nobody wants to do it again in the future. Like it makes that whole thing even harder. So you can kind of like not only bungle that transition, but make it even harder in the future by forcing those things through. That's something I haven't always been good at, trying to be mindful of the appetite of the folks around me for executing well on that change. And then you get into that situation where everybody is just shot. And like, I mean, that's been COVID. Like COVID relief just ran us into the ground. But there was all this change that needed to happen and we tried to run it through anyways. And like you just, you put the whole thing in jeopardy and then people aren't at their best when you like, need to make this stuff happen. And it becomes just this really frustrating situation. And so it can be hard to like put away that rational ROI cap. And like there's, there's, I guess it's worth acknowledging that there's going to be times where it's like, yeah, this is a way better way to do this. But right now we don't have the people and we don't have the energy to make it happen, unfortunately. Now, obviously there's a lot of like ways to manage that. And, you know, be mindful of that and the people that you hire and how you incentivize people and encouraging a culture of change. And there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, But forcing the issue, in my experience, can create bigger issues than you think you're going to solve by like ramming that change through. Hey, this episode is sponsored in part by Firm 360. It is a practice management system that's just going to it's just going to make it easier to get all get all the stuff done. As we talked about last week, it's Firm 360 because it covers everything in your firm. A single tool, projects, billing, files, all the goods, all in one place. Uh, Check out this testimonial from Janet Long from Peerless CFO Services. See if this see if this sounds familiar. See if this sounds like you. Janet was looking for a solution for managing her firm's projects as their current methods of using spreadsheets. Oh, bless your heart, Janet was starting to fall apart as the firm grew. Hey, we all started somewhere. We all started with that back of the napkin managing projects and it's just a mess. And then you start hiring people and they're like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be working on right now. Let me tell you, they implemented Firm 360 and were able to see major improvements in their visibility into staff workload and increased team productivity. Who doesn't want that? Quote, I'm always so impressed with your team and how fast you respond to requests. We never imagined getting such wonderful support help when we signed up for Firm 360, but it has been a blessing for sure. Hey, does that sound like you? You still hustling those sheets? Stop it. Are you a Janet? Don't be a Janet. No, do be a Janet. And get on to something better, something that your team's gonna love and your clients will send you nice gift baskets for about. What? Firm 360? Learn more in the in the link in the show notes below. Now, what's really frustrating here is when you make your own internal agenda and you're like, here's the things I'm excited for, but then you're impacted by external change that is outside your control. And so that could be new legislation, could be an unexpected thing like COVID relief coming up and totally derailing your plans. This is kind of one of those things where like you have to almost like bake in a degree of patience, like a patience allowance for the unexpected because there will almost always be new stuff. Like I was a tax pro in Oregon where they were just spinning up new taxes left and right. And those things often didn't kick off in a very streamlined way. And it created a bunch of additional work that we had to do for our clients and we had to explain to them why it was important and it was all really frustrating because we had our own plans for what we wanted to do that year and on that list was not 
help clients navigate this new tax. Like that was the last thing that I wanted to do in my firm running journey and getting us to this more efficient place. But no amount of that being frustrating to me is going to give those people their energy back. So like there will be times where that that plan for change will get derailed and that's okay. And it's another example of where I think in our heads, by default, we are always thinking about the best case scenario where everything goes swimmingly and nothing unexpected comes up, right? It's like how you plan the rest of your week. That plan only includes all of the things that are on your radar right now. And inevitably, things come up that were not on your radar, which means 100% of the time you fail to meet the plan. And then you're like, how did I get to the end of this day and not get all of these things done? And it's just kind of another way where we kind of set that bar too high for ourselves, I think, because we're not accounting for all of the unexpected things. Those have been some of the most frustrating Ugh, like change management periods in my life when we're like, okay, we worked really hard and we made this plan and we're trying to do it in a responsible way. And then this other thing came up and we don't have anybody to work on it. And is this really just going to bungle this big plan that we've tried to execute in a responsible way? That's frustrating, buddy. That's life. That's probably yet another argument for like excess capacity and trying to like and not like always having the team at the limit because you never know what's going to come up particularly around change management like there's that is there's a lot of excess capacity that could be consumed by that like if you can find a great admin operator that can be a good help with this stuff that is absolutely excess capacity worth having if they can help run that change through and then those people, it's like if they're new people, like they're immediately super useful because they are the subject matter expert in that new thing. And they have like a deeper level of understanding of the business than they would otherwise had they not helped you through that process. Now, another thing I've had to uh, get better about is changing existing processes without crushing the spirits of the people involved. Uh, Alex Kalaf, am I saying that right? Kalaf? sent me some of these bullet points. This was a good one of his. Um, oftentimes we, when we're doing that super robotic, like rational ROI calculation, we overlook ex like, okay, this process is better. Let's go do this. We overlook how the person that currently oversees that process is gonna feel about it. You know, Maybe how the person who built that previous process is going to feel about it. And oftentimes, getting aggressive with change like that can kind of steamroll people. Uh, and that's not really a fun place to be in. I will say in the beginning of my firm running journey, this was a big problem. And you had people that were territorial around the processes that they managed because that was their baby, because they thought that was their job. And so to come in and change that or even move it to somebody else, like the the natural fear that person's going to have is around like self-preservation, not necessarily what is right or wrong. I think over time we got better about that being something culturally within the firm that was more accepted and we almost framed as being something to expect, not to like personalize change, um, and to understand that like amidst change, people's roles are going to be pretty fluid and ch like ultimately for you, progression in your career has to look like moving to new tasks. There is no progression to have as long as you're doing the same things. So there's generally going to be opportunities in those changes. But in my early, in my early firm days, a lot of the resistance that I got when I was like, hey gang, this is like a fundamentally better way to do this thing, was not like, the pushback was not through a rational lens, which was really hard for me to understand. Like the world is much simpler for me when I'm you know, at that age and I don't understand the politics of all these things that have been happening and this, you know, this person who got put in charge of this thing for 15 years, after 15 years, and they were really proud of that. And I come in and I'm like, man, this is dumb. Like, why do, why do we do it this way? Like, this way is very obviously better. I wasn't that flippant about it, but I think that's how it's received from the person on the other side of it. So, the, like, the more that you can try to maintain a culture of 
collaborative change and change not being somebody's fault. We're not changing this process because Steve bungled the process. We're changing this because we've learned, because the world is changing, because the tech that we use is changing. This is a big stopper to like entrepreneurship, I think, is person A not wanting to step on person B's toes. And the more that that can be like a, that culture can become more collaborative and people are rewarded for those ideas and for speaking up and putting their nose out, but then also for being like champions of that change and actually making it happen and executing on it. Then like in my experience, the less personalized that stuff has been. Because if you're in a, if you're in a practice where change is hard and you have a bunch of change averse people, I think change can be very personal and you like no amount of rationalizing a, a, better timeline, a better way of doing something will like overcome that very human aspect of feeling threatened by change, feeling like it's their fault that that's no longer the right way to do something. And like that all starts from the top with the tone and the attitude that you set around change. That was probably the hardest, probably the hardest aspect of me for working with other people because we're full of ideas. You know, I was the type of person that would like tune into, you know, whatever the 2010 version of this show was and be like, gang, I just learned this new thing. You got to check this out. I'm so pumped about it. And for me, that's very black and white. But when the other people hear it, they're like, oh, yeah, but what about that work we did six years ago to like revamp all these processes? And now like Susan's in charge of this and that and that complicates this. But when you're still like baby face new to a firm and you're just motivated to make that stuff happen and make an impact, you don't think of all that context. But yeah, if there's like, if there's one takeaway here, uh, I think for navigating change and managing that conversation with your superiors, I think one of the best things I learned was that like, ultimately your firm, how it feels, what it's like to operate day to day is a product of all of the clients and all of the work that you do right now. And as long as you're too afraid of upsetting that apple cart and changing what gets done, how it gets done, and who you do it for, until you're willing to disrupt that, you won't get to a better place. And even if the place right now is okay, man, like you should never stop growing. You should never stop getting more specific in what you do and, and developing like your approach to doing this work into something that is more refined. And that starts with like ideating right now we're here, like what's the slightly better version of this that we can start with the very next client? This is like an, a hypothesis that we have right now that we want to test. Let's try it with a new client, see if we can get a few wins to see if this makes sense. If it does, then you, then you like start thinking about a bigger rollout to the other clients. Maybe it's something that you eventually make mandatory, but you got to start small, like the stakeholders involved have to get some easy wins. And rather than Rather than getting super rational and being like, hey, this is totally better than this, because that very well might be, instead of that, paint the picture of like what the firm looks like that is leaning into that. That is appealing. Like that is a vision that people can get behind more so than being laser focused on the specific process or the specific thing that you want to do is like paint the picture of what that future firm can look like, get people plugged into that vision and then start taking baby steps. Figure out a way that, that stakeholders can get some small wins to start stepping in that direction. And like, that's the way to make that happen. Not like stamping your feet over this like ideological difference, right? Like that doesn't ultimately get people from A to B, I don't think. Uh, what do you think? Uh, for the folks that have navigated this stuff successfully and maybe that are on the other side of this, any positive um, advice you'd have for folks who are stuck in these situations? Uh, struggling in places that where change is really hard. Uh, would love to see any advice that you got down in the comments. Thanks for coming and hanging. We got Q&A Wednesday tomorrow. If you got any cues, drop them in the comments. And I'll see you tomorrow.